What's up, Foundry? How's it going? This is a week for a lot of you, isn't it? That uh, you would have walked the stage, got the diploma, all that kind of good stuff. Really hate that you didn't. Weren't able to do it. Like I said, we are haven't figured it out yet. <clears throat> Sometime in the month of June, we'll figure it out. Do a Sunday morning and celebrate your accomplishments. Just the fact that you don't walk across the stage does not diminish what you've accomplished. Please don't forget that. I know it's disappointing, a little disheartening as well, but what you accomplish now will have kind of a, a red underscore said, we did it in the midst of some really tough times. I was watching um, uh, Tonight Show last night. They had uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, I'll be back. That guy. Pretty good. You didn't know that was Arnold Schwarzenegger or me, did you? But anyway, um, he had something I thought was really good. He said that this is this is a learning time that life will not be simple. It's going to be difficult. You are going to experience setbacks a lot of the time. What you do with them will really determine how well life is handled by you. Well, let's talk about life tonight a little bit. Big topic, right? But um, these last few weeks, there have been times you say, I don't know what to do, because you're used to <clears throat> living a very in a very structured environment. If you got a part-time job, you know your boss expects you to be there. If you're in if you're in school, you got homework assigned to you, tests that are coming up, books that you gotta read, or supposed to, right? <clears throat> so all those things are kind of laid out for you, and as a result, your priorities are to full, fulfill someone else's expectations. All right? If you don't fulfill them, you get a bad grade, and uh, you don't want to avoid that, so that's what you do. But what happens, like in these, these moments, these days that we've had with the pandemic and vi uh, virus going around and staying at home, and it's really easy, isn't it, to... Stay in your pajamas all day. I'm not judging. Uh, catch up on a lot of TV. Play play video games. <clears throat> eat, eat more than what you wanted to. All those kinds of things are easy because no one's telling you what to do. And therein lies a problem. Because literally, much of your life, no one will be telling you what to do. Oh, I, I know there's going to be people. You, you're going to get uh, a boss, and they're going to say, this is what I expect you to do. <clears throat> you may get married later on. Your, your, your spouse is going to say, this is what I need for you to do. And uh, I, I get that. But let's face it. You're pretty good. So am I. It kind of skipping by some of those things, getting by, not doing what you want to do, um, and kind of, halfway fulfilling the job. It's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is your responsibility to yourself. You want to have a good life, correct? Now, herein lies the rub. How do you define a good life? Well, you've got some options. You can define it by uh, economically. I uh, got a good job. Pay my bills, able to scrape up some money to buy a house and a decent car, and therefore, I got a good life. You might define it relationally. I found someone that I love, and they love me back, and we got married, and uh, that's all I need. That's okay. Got that. You might define it positionally by your education. You... You've uh, graduated top of your class. You have ambitions to also graduate dean's list and, and uh, summa cum laude and all that kind of 
good stuff. You, you want to get a master's and maybe even a doctorate degree. And that will define your success because you did what you set out to accomplish. All of those things are good. There's nothing bad with those things. However, how you define your life to be a success is critical. Here is the, I think it was Camus, who was a uh, existentialist, if you know who that is, atheist, agnostic, playwright, author, French. He said, death is the worm at the, at the core of the apple of life. That's a pretty good metaphor. Let me say it again. Death is the worm at the core of the apple of life. Now, today, they're pretty good on how they raise apples and, and make sure apples are okay. But if you've ever gone to an apple field that, you know, it's, it's not a professional apple field. And you pull an apple off and it looks good. It really it looks okay. It looks fine. And you bite into it and halfway down, you see something wiggly. And you didn't see it from the outside, but at the core, there was a worm that had gotten in there early enough in that, in that apple's growth period that you didn't see something from the outside, but the worm was there on the inside. And you know what you do with that apple? You say, hey, this apple's cool. I'm going to eat this worm and all. I don't think so. I don't think so. When you see that apple with a worm in the core, you go, Egh! and you as quickly as you can, you toss it as far as you can, and you start going, bleh, bleh, bleh. you got something to drink, I want to rinse my mouth out. Because you're afraid you might have gotten some of that worm, right? Well, that's what Camus said about life. At the center of our life, we get through all the outer layers. We get the education. We get the relationship. We get the, the, uh, the job. We get the economical blessings. All those kind of things are the outside. But when you keep, life has a way of keep keeping you eating down to the core. And at the core is something you didn't expect. Camus says it's death. And all through our earlier life, we have realized it's there, the potential it's there, but it's not going to bother us, right? We're, we're going to be okay with this. It's going to be okay. We don't need to deal with this at the moment. But life continues to take those layers away. And when we get down to the end of life, at the center of life, is death. Why is that a problem? Because relationally, every marriage, if it, if it lasts all the way through to the very end, no divorce, a great relationship, at the end, one of the two will die first and leave the other one alone. I hate to bring it to you, but that's the way life is. Economically, you've gotten a great house. Everything worked out really well. Big house, nice bank account, beautiful car. Everything went really, really well. At the end of life, it doesn't matter how much you have or how little you have because when you go and you face death, you turn loose of everything. Educationally. Educationally, you got the great you got the great education and all those things and all the things that goes with it. And who's to say at the end of life you begin to experience something called Alzheimer's, which leads to death, and you've forgotten everything you ever knew. Boy, what a downer this is, right? Right. Well, I'm saying all this to bring some reality in your life because what you do with life 
matters. So my question, going back to what I was talking about, in setting priorities, what are your priorities? What are your priorities? And here's what I've learned and what I really, really believe and what I really, really want you to wrestle with is that your teacher, your circumstances, your desire for wealth or relationship, those things, if those things set your priorities, they end, they don't end up well. They just don't end up well. Because everything's gone, that death is the worm at the core of life. And it's been there all along. So what I'm telling you, if you have circumstances that set your priorities in your life, you will be disappointed when you come to the end of your life. Yes, you will. So what do I do? You ask. I'm glad you asked. The only way that you can learn how something functions, all right? You want to, you got a, got something you're building, you got a motor, you're needing to make it work right. You must go to someone who built it. They're the ones who tell you how to do it. They're the ones who tell you how to do it. So who is the one who built you? God. Yeah, that was an easy answer. So if we go to the one who created us, you see, if, if you have an engine and you say, man, I got a surplus of water. This would be great. Why don't I put water in the tank and it's going to be good. I love this motor. It's going to work. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. This is a motor that's designed to work on gasoline. And if you pour anything other than gasoline into this, it won't work. And if you try to pour any other priorities other than God's priorities into your life, it won't work. It works for a time, but it ends in disaster. So, what are your priorities? Well, let me give you three from my lesson tonight. Someone asked Jesus, and by the way, who is the smartest man that ever lived? If you say anyone other than Jesus Christ, you've lost. Right? Why is Jesus the smartest man who ever lived? Because he is God, the creator of everything that we consider knowledge. He started it all. He created it all. So that would make sense, wouldn't it? The one who gave us all knowledge has more than our knowledge. So Jesus is the smartest man who ever lived. And someone came and said, hey, Jesus, what should we do? What does God want us to do? What is, what's, the, what's at the top of the priority chain? What is it? And here's what he said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's your number one priority. Love God. That sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? Love God. I love God. No problems. You know, my number one priority as a husband is to love Brenda. Sounds easy, doesn't it? There are times it's not that easy. There are times that I'm distracted. There are times that I got a lot of stuff going on in my mind, not a lot of stuff on my plate. There are times that that uh, we're we're facing problems, and it's a struggle. It's it's not always it's not easy. Listen, don't don't buy everything you hear uh, playing on Spotify, okay? About love. Love makes me feel so good, and I'm just, without it, I'm nothing, and, you know. Yeah. But God's love is different, because God's love being eternal, complete, it's critical that I do place Him first. Remember, I've said this many times. 
that a good definition of sin is disordered love. Because in every, every thing that I do, the first thing that I should ask myself, is this leading me to pursue God? Is this revealing something about God to me? In every educational activity, economic activity, relationship activity, you get it. Everything. Is this something that leads me to a better understanding of God? Can I love him more through this? Second thing. As in Mark chapter 12, verse 28 and following. Next one is Matthew chapter 6, 16 through 21. And Jesus is speaking to a bunch of people on the Sermon on the Mount. It's up on the mountain. He's teaching them about kingdom activities. What's kingdom activity? Well, it's if you live with God as king, with Jesus as king, this is how your life should be structured. And here's what he says. Lay up treasures for yourselves. Yeah. Fisher, was it, uh, I forget the name of these. These companies, investment companies, Merrill Lynch and all of them, you know, these various things are saying, stock market is going to come back, play it smart, invest now, you're going to get great dividends later. And you're pro they're probably right. So you lay up for yourself treasures. I'm, I'm one of these days going to retire when I, when I get old enough. I don't know when that's going to be. And I've laid up some treasures. Not enough. I've laid up some treasures, some things to pay bills when I'm, I'm not pulling in an income at all. Right? That's a smart thing to do. But here, here's the deal. Again, apple, worm, core, death, that whole thing. I can lay up all the treasures I want and die. I mean, it didn't do me any good. But if I lay up treasures for heaven, ooh, how long does heaven last? It lasts, that's right, forever. Lasts forever. And that's why we lay up treasures there. First, do we ignore, I'm going to live like a, somebody has no money and I'm not going to have a home. And No, that's not what I'm saying. But we're talking about priorities, right? We're talking about priorities. What do we do first? How do you lay up treasures? Well, how do you do it now? You work for it. You work at it. Now, you don't get saved by working at it, but we have great effort in trying to do things that are honoring, pleasing, loving God. And the more we love him, the more good things we're laying up for us. You are doing well when you're loving God in a practical way. Helping others, speaking of his name, being a part of a group of, of fellow believers and growing and helping them grow in love and understanding. You are laying for yourself treasures in heaven. Third one, Luke chapter 12, verse 29 through 31. And here's a good one. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Does that mean I don't do, don't worry about this world? No. You know what I know about God? I know that God created this world to be perfect and we screwed it up when we sinned. And this world lost its wholeness, perfection. But you know what? When the whistle blows and time ends, God is going to transform this world and, and our bodies will be resurrected and we will have new bodies. We're going to live in a material world. He thinks so highly of this world that he's going to use this world and transform it. Make it perfect. Tells me that I should care about this world now. So it's not saying, I care about heaven, I care zero about this world. No, just the opposite. I care so much for heaven that it makes me care rightly and correctly and even more so for this world, right? But my priority is, that I seek God's kingdom first. That means when I see injustice, I speak out, not because it's wrong, but because this is God's kingdom. And I need to 
speak up the, for the way that I believe God would want me to live my life and you should live your life. Yeah. These are the things that we need to be aware of. These are the priorities. Okay, how can we do them? Well, I, I won't even talk about the verses. If you look those other ones up, Mark 12, 28 through 30, Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Luke 12, 29 through 31, that'll be super. If you do that, you're laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. Gotcha. These others, I'll just mention them. Psalm 5, 3 is to spend every day, sometime in the day through prayer. I like when I wake up in the morning, my alarm goes off. I like to set it early enough that I can spend some time laying in bed. Sometimes, can I confess? Sometimes I go back to sleep. But on the good days that I'm really mentally aware, I spend time in prayer. It's the things that are on my mind. I like to get them off my mind right at the very beginning. Before I go to exercise, I want to speak with God. I like to speak with Him when I'm reading. When I hear something, it just breaks me down. I listened to a song Sunday morning. I was in tears, guys. Because it was about Psalm 23. Surely goodness, surely mercy will follow me all my days. Surely. And it just came over me like a, a waterfall. And I, I was... I was in tears because I felt so absolutely unworthy that his mercy and his goodness will follow me all the days of my life. Mm -mm -mm. Wow. Spend time with God in prayer. Second thing, Joshua 1.8, read and meditate on scripture. If you're not reading the Bible, even just from some verses, what's your, what's your excuse, guys? What is your excuse? I've, I've been preaching this statue for years now. You don't have an excuse. You stand for God and he said, I gave you an assignment and you didn't open your book? What excuse do you have? And you're going to say, well, the dog ate my homework. No, no, it won't work. You simply are negligent when you know better, right? You said, that's not my priority. I don't care about God. I got other stuff. Sin. Disordered love, remember that? Hmm? Third thing, Hebrews 10, 25. Meet with other believers. Don't neglect. Bring yourselves together with others. You need to be, whenever we get back to Wednesday nights, be a month or so, but what's what's keeping you from being here on Sunday morning? We'd love to see you. I'd, I'd be so encouraged to see you. You're my, you're my, you're my peeps. I love to see you. Fourth thing, Philippians 3, 3, 13 through 14 is live to fulfill God's call at, or his will for your life. You, you press, press on for the high calling of God. Press on. You make it your life's ambition to know what God wants for you. And then you go for it, man. You go for it. You hold nothing back. The last one is 1 Corinthians 10, 31. In everything you do, everything, eating, friendships, schoolwork, everything, you do it to honor and glorify God. End with a sad note. And you may have no clue who I'm talking about. And I wish you would. I wish like anything that you would. I have referred to him numerous times, and you can get online, rzim.com, rzim.com, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries.com. Ravi Zacharias was a, was a man, was an incredible intellect, incredible intellect. Indian, when he was 19, I believe it was, it was either 17 or 19. He was, a, he was an atheist agnostic living in India. His, his greatest ambition was to be a cricket player, and he realized he was not that good. He was never going to make it professionally. He was depressed. He was discouraged. He literally tried to end his life. I think it was his mother that found him. 
rushed him to the hospital. He saved his life. A Christian entered into his life, shared with him the gospel, and therein began a quest of seeking for God. He trusted in him and felt a calling on his life to share with others who had no interest or belief in a God who he was because he came that way. He was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. And he said, why should I even live? It doesn't matter. And he tried to take his own life. His life has touched literally millions of lives around the world. In his defense of the gospel and who is God and what is he up to and how could you believe in someone like that and I don't believe in God and he has spoken so faithfully and so courageously and so gently. And that's why I say, go to rzim.com and look up some of his YouTube things. Oh my goodness sakes. He's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Great books. Today, he died. Just a couple of months ago, he went in for back surgery. They discovered something called a sarcoma, a cancer, in a very odd place, and it was incredibly aggressive. And two months later, he died at home. There was nothing they could do for him. 74 years old, but still incredibly active. He had many more great years left. Here's the deal. In his death, his priorities were always God's priorities. And he, he died contented knowing that he was had done what God had asked him to do. And I can only imagine, and I'm just pulling from that song, I can only imagine what it is for him to have left this earth and entered into heaven, into the very presence of the one that he said, you are my priority. You are my priority. I want to tell you something, guys. The worm at the core of life in Ravi Zechariah's, it may have been there, but it didn't mean a thing because death could not hold or defeat him. Why? Because that was the that was the tale of Jesus who dying for our sins death could not hold him. Death could not defeat him. What are your priorities today? One of these days we will end our existence will end. I want you to Look back as a Ravi Zacharias could have looked back and said, I did what you asked me to do. This week, we'll be in touch with you soon. Love you guys. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.